Clock Tower on the PS1 is still easily one of my favorite games of all time. It embodies everything that a good horror game should. Mystery, tension, and pure fear. Like a game of tug of war, Clock Tower pulls you back and forth from dialogue segments where you learn more about the game's characters and drive the larger narrative forward. Then you're thrust into the game's many scenarios where you play one of the game's handful of main characters as they try to piece together the mystery of Scissor Man while weaving in and out of terrifying encounters with him. <laughs> I like both halves of the game equally, but these scenarios are clearly the main course of the game. And they all have their strong points, but if I had to pick a favorite, it would be the scenario of Rick's house. This scenario takes place at about the middle point of the game, and in the house of the Barrows family's former butler, it can be accessed either with Nolan, a local news reporter and low-key love interest of the Clock Tower protagonist Jennifer, or it can be played by Stan Gotts, an aging but seasoned assistant inspector who's been tasked with overseeing the Clock Tower investigation. Gotts is an interesting character, perhaps one of the more interesting in the entire game. He starts off early on as a huge doubter of the supernatural, and at times seems like he's frustrated to have the whole Scissor Man situation fall into his lap. And as his old friend Helen Maxwell and Jennifer have their run-ins with the scissor-wielding maniac, he remains steadfast in his frustration with what he thinks is a very non-supernatural situation. Rick's house changes all of that, though. Depending on choices you make earlier in the game, your heroine is either Helen or Jennifer, and based on a totally separate choice, a very important statue key to defeating Scissor Man later on in the game is either located in the library or Rick's house. To get all of the endings, you'll want to explore every combination of these events, but to me, the best way to play this game is with Helen as the heroine, and the statue ending up at Rick's house. If you do that, you'll end up playing Gots in that level, and things start off calmly enough. Rick seems to have found a nice, quiet house in the woods to spend his retirement in, understandably looking forward to spending the rest of his life away from the Barrow's castle and the evils that reside there. Gotts is desperately looking for clues though, so Rick is a vital source of information for that investigation. Immediately, Rick starts to dish out details. The Barrow's Castle is where the monster came from, but according to Rick, it was killed by its father a long time ago. Intrigued, Gotts becomes fixated on the location of the castle, asking Rick to tell him where it is. As Rick tries to remember, things start to go wrong. For some reason, Rick's dog starts acting up in an uncharacteristic way. As Rick approaches his dog, it's clear something is horribly wrong with it. What's wrong, Victor? Be quiet. It's okay, boy. What's the matter? You make such a racket. Gotts shuts the door to shield himself from the deranged dog as the lights are cut off, and wouldn't you know it, Scissor Man appears. Gotts decides to pop a couple of caps in his ass, but as you might expect, it's useless. This is the first rude awakening that Gotts is not just dealing with some psycho in a mask. This is something much more evil and much more dangerous. The player is given control of Gotts, and you play him more or less like you do the other characters. You hide from Scissor Man, explore the level, and try your best to find a safe exit while moving the plot forward as you go. Oh! No need to rush, though, because Rick's house is packed with lots of great scares and interesting moments that make this level such a standout in the game to me. Oh! Depending on what ending you're trying to get, you have a few different objectives to accomplish here. If the statue was sent to Rick's house earlier in the game, you'll need to find it on the coffee table in the den upstairs. You'll also need to locate the Barrow's Castle address, which is located oddly behind a painting in the den as well. But in order for any of this stuff to matter, you ultimately have to get the powdered soap from the laundry room to blind Rick's insane dog to get past him and escape. 
Only do this on your way out though, because once you do it, there's no turning back, and if you've missed one of the other objectives, you'll be screwed out of the ending associated with that object. If you already know all of this, then Rick's house can be completed in just a few minutes, but that would be doing yourself a disservice, and you'd be missing out on some of the better moments in the game. Running into Scissorman is different in Rick's house than in every other level. In the first scenario, you're in a massive three-story building. In the library, you also have a lot of space to create distance. And of course, the castle at the end is massive, giving you a lot of options. But in Rick's house, it feels much more claustrophobic. No matter where you are, while Scissorman is chasing you, he's basically never more than one room away. That, coupled with the fact that most of the house's rooms only have one way in and out, really gives you a sense of urgency while he's pursuing you. You really have to think on your feet and work with whatever is in your immediate vicinity. And if you aren't super quick about it, your hiding place might not work. Thankfully, Clock Tower does mercifully give you two precious shots at panic mode, where you can tap square just before Scissor Man kills you and temporarily evade him. Most of these animations are pretty entertaining, but Gots easily has the best one, as he just hauls off and delivers his fist straight into Scissor Man's suck hole. As you explore the house, you'll find several great little moments. For instance, in the kitchen, if you screw around with the oven, it flares up, scaring the hell out of Gots and probably you if you don't know it's coming. You can also check the trap door in the middle of the room, but I wouldn't recommend this unless you're trying to trigger Scissor Man. There's usually a good chance he's hiding there. You can use it as a place to hide from him if he's already chasing you though, so it has dual purposes. More interestingly, if you inspect the decorative mask on the wall, it'll start to float, along with a couple other objects in the room, and they try to attack you. I love this part, because it's one of those things in the game that sort of hints at Scissor Man being more than just a monster. Yes, he is a monster himself, but it's not just him you have to deal with, it's also things around him. It's as if everywhere Scissor Man goes becomes haunted by his presence. It's like he's the center of some sort of black hole, drawing in his surroundings and corrupting people and objects with some sort of gravitational pull of evil. He also seems to have the same effect on people too, with the esteemed Professor Barton's initial fascination with the Clock Tower case eventually leading him to become a copycat Scissor Man himself as well as Harris, whose obsession with Jennifer eventually leads him to a similar fate. Scissor Man is more than just an evil entity. It's as if he's a vessel for evil itself. In any case, just throw the salt shaker at the mask. If you want to get any of the better endings, you'll need to eventually head up the stairs to the second floor. This is where the statue and the Barrow's Castle address are located for Gots you'll want to head into Rick's bedroom first, to at least unlock the door to the balcony. You might need this if you get in a pinch later on. Further down the hall is the den, where you may or may not trigger another one of the level's more memorable moments as you walk in on somebody watching cartoons and laughing maniacally. Inspecting the rocking chair will lead to an odd moment where Gots creeps up to the chair, seemingly under the impression it might be somebody other than Scissor Man, which I guess I could understand because why the hell would Scissor Man be watching cartoons? But nope, it's him. This might seem goofy to a first time player, but if you're on your second or third time through, it'll make more sense to you as Edward, the kid who supposedly survived the Clock Tower murders before, is actually Scissor Man, which you find out later. So in this way, it actually makes sense that he would take a break from killing people to watch cartoons. This will trigger yet another encounter with him, but if you're fast enough, you can run right back to Rick's bedroom and hide in the closet, using either the deck or the main hallway. If you're not fast enough to do that, then you might end up back downstairs, where you'll have to figure something else out. Or punch him. Great. Either way, once you're rid of him, this is where the level comes together, as Gots finds the statue and the Barrow's Castle info in that same room. To a new player, this can be a spot where you get tripped up, because if you didn't have the statue sent to Rick's house, it won't actually be here. It's in the library with Professor Sullivan. You can still get the Barrow's Castle info and beat the level, but you won't get the A ending. There's nothing wrong with this though, as I think to truly experience Clock Tower, you need to get all the endings anyway. And this is a legitimate path to getting at least one of them. Either way, once you've wrapped all of that up, it's time to give that dog's face a free sample of detergent and get the hell out of there.
While Rick's house is far from the biggest level in Clock Tower, nor is it the most memorable in a lot of people's eyes, it's still probably my favorite one. It's just such a well-crafted horror game level that packs a sizable chunk of lore for the game, a huge turning point for the endings you're eligible for, and a handful of other surprises all within its walls. It also fleshes out the characters of Nolan and Gotts surprisingly well, by letting you play them for just that one level before turning you back over to either Helen or Jennifer for the final scenario in the castle. For Nolan, it turns him into more than just a dude who's trying to get with Jennifer, as it gets him personally invested in the clock tower mess himself. But with Gotts, more interestingly, it turns him into more than just a flustered detective who's trying to wrap up this case as fast as possible by turning him into a believer of Scissorman, who is now done doubting his friend Helen, and just as invested in seeing him defeated as anybody else. It unites all of the characters and puts them in a position to work together, track down the origin of Scissorman's evil, and destroy him once and for all. 